everyone here today. Before we get into the Word of God, the children are dismissed into the children's worship at this time. Today we are receiving an offering for the Gideons, and we've supported them for the 42 years I've been here, and it's a great ministry. Uh, Many people over the years have come to know Jesus Christ by uh, the Gideon ministry because of the dispersion of Bibles, and they have given out millions of Bibles in different languages all over the world, and it's a great ministry. We know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so we encourage you to be a part of that, and um, all of that which comes in loose today will go for the purchase of Bibles, and that's it. If you have your Bibles today, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 11, and we're going to look at the importance of baptism. I've been preaching here 42 years, and I've never did an entire message on baptism. And so we've mentioned it in maybe hundreds of messages, but um, not entirely on baptism. Uh, Don't forget, we do have a funeral here for David Smith just a rather young man, 59, that died of pneumonia unexpectedly, and I'll be praying for uh, his son, Connor, and his wife, Christy, as we have that funeral today here at 2 o'clock. You know, timing is important in everything, and uh, Brooks Hayes, who was a U.S. representative from Arkansas, he liked to tell the story of a prisoner who received a letter from his wife. And honey, it said, I just, I'm lost without you. I don't know when to plant the potatoes, and I can't even plow the garden uh, to plant the potatoes. And the prisoner wrote a letter back to his wife and says, honey, don't worry about planting those potatoes. And whatever you do, don't go anywhere near that garden. Don't dig in the garden because That's where I buried the money that I stole. Uh, She wrote back, Honey, I think someone is reading our mail because the day after your letter, four FBI agents showed up and they dug up every square inch of our garden and they didn't find any money. He wrote back and said, Now, darling, plant the potatoes. You know, timing is everything. Timing is very critical with God. And why didn't Jesus begin his ministry when he was 20 years old or when he was 25 years old? Uh, Why did he wait until he was 30 to begin his earthly ministry? And Galatians 4.4 says, when the time was right, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem us, it says, from the law. And Jesus waited until he was 30 years old, until the time was right to launch his ministry, and he began his ministry by being baptized. Jesus had a ministry that lasted more than three years on this earth, and of all the things he could have started his ministry with and ended his ministry with, He started it with baptism, and he concluded it with baptism, telling us to go and make disciples and then baptize others. Now, since baptism was the, you might call it the bookends of the ministry of the Lord Jesus, that alone tells us that baptism is a big deal. Uh, It is, but not because of the reason why some people think it's a big deal. There are two extreme ways that people have uh, viewed baptism, and I call them extremes because there's one that says that baptism saves you. If you're going to be saved, if you're going to go to heaven, then you must be baptized. They believe in a baptismal regeneration, and to them it's a big deal. 
And then there's another group that says baptism is unnecessary to go to heaven. The thief on the cross never had a chance to be baptized, but Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Therefore, to them, it's not a big deal. And my friends, in this case, the truth lies somewhere in the middle because both groups are half right. Baptism is unnecessary to go to heaven, but it's still a big deal because it's a church ordinance. It's a command of God. We are a Baptist church, and Webster defines a Baptist church as a member of a Protestant denomination holding that baptism should be given only to believers after a confession of faith and by immersion rather than sprinkling. That's Webster's definition. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? You hear that question quite often. He had never sinned, therefore he never had to repent of his sin because there were none. He died for his for our sins, not his own. He was sinless. He was pure perfection. But in John's gospel, it says that when Jesus approached John, and he said, John, I want you to baptize me. And John said, oh no, I'm not worthy to baptize you. In fact, Jesus, you ought to baptize me. And Jesus pleaded with John, and he said, John, you baptize me because I, I must be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, which means I need to be baptized because it is the right thing to do. Now, I want to make something very clear. Baptism is important, not because Baptists say it is, but because the Bible says that it is. In fact, the Bible talks about being baptized or bab uh, baptisms 74 times. If it was found one time in the Word of God, it would be important. But it's found 74 times, folks. And baptism, again, is not a Baptist idea. It's a Bible idea. And in order to understand why baptism is a big deal, I want to answer three questions with you this morning. Number one, what is the meaning of baptism? Let's go ahead and read what Mark has to say about the baptism of Jesus, found in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So in this passage, in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it gives us the details about the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. This was the kickoff. And so if you went back in time, if you went back 2,000 years to the first century, to the days of Jesus, you would have heard a Greek word that was used in everyday language to describe a variety of situations. For the Greek word is baptizo. Uh, baptisma, baptizo. The word meant to immerse. It meant to dip. It meant to dunk. It was used to describe ships that sunk at sea. It was used to describe, in fact, Vine's Greek dictionary says that it was used to dye garments, cloth. You put it under all the way. You immerse the garment under the dye to dye it properly. And that is what it uses, the analogy that it uses. So it is important uh, that we see it as immersion. One ancient Jewish historian even described a man who was murdered by baptism. That simply meant that he was murdered by someone drowning him. And now, incidentally, let me just say that I am sure he was not sprinkled to death. I'm positive of that. Uh, for a long period of time, the word baptizo had no relig uh, religious significance whatsoever, none, zilch. Women baptized their dishes, uh, ships that were sinking or that sunk 
were baptized into the sea, kids playing in a river, they dunked each other, and, and they baptized each other. And then one day a man showed up. He was a man from the wilderness. He, he, he uh, was one that ate locusts and honey. And his name was John. And he began baptizing people, telling them to repent. Mark 1.4 tells us John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And John said that baptism is an outward sign that you've been changed inwardly. That there's an inward repentance. In fact, he became so identified with the new meaning of this word that they begin to call him John the Baptizer. And then others called him John the Baptist. And John did something in a religious setting that never had been done before. Uh, the, he baptized people who wanted to repent of their sin and who placed their faith in God. And of course, this all was before Jesus had died upon the cross. And John the Baptist, as we know, was the forerunner of Christ. But now it's important to see how John baptized the Lord Jesus. Notice verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized of John in the Jordan. And then it goes on in verse 10, and it tells us that Jesus then immediately came up out of the water. Now, the reason that Jesus came up out of the water is because he had been placed down in the water. Uh, but there's a reason why John not only baptized Jesus in this fashion, but also in this place. He baptized them in the Jordan River. And it, at certain times of the year, of course, it's much higher, sort of like the Dan River, uh, than at other times. But in John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, uh, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples, they came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them, and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing in Enon and Salim because there was much water there. And they came, and it says they were baptized. Now, the, that statement is very interesting. It really is, because why did John have to have much water? I mean, after all, it doesn't take much water to sprinkle people. You know, in, if baptism was done by sprinkling, I could take two glasses of water and baptize all the people probably in both services, both the more early worship and, and this worship service. So why does it take much water? Well, the reason is because to be baptized, according to the Scripture, you have to go down into the water, and that is exactly what we read about the Lord Jesus. Uh, we also read it about another man in the Bible. It is found in Acts chapter 8, verse 38, and it says, He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip, it says, and the eunuch, meaning the Ethiopian eunuch, went down into the water, and he, Philip baptized him, it says. So now why is it necessary to go down into the water? Because in order to be baptized, you've got to be buried beneath the water, which is exactly how Paul describes baptism in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, where he says, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also walk, it says, in the newness of life. When you bury a corpse, you don't take a few ounces of dirt and sprinkle it on the corpse and leave it out there to bake in the sun, do you? No. You bury the body beneath the ground. And a baptistry is meant to be a liquid tomb where a person is buried beneath the water. As we have already seen, you not only go down into the water, if you go down, you have to come back up out of the water. Now, if you go down into the water and you're buried beneath the water, and you come up out of the water, then you only conclude 
that you have been immersed in the water. Without question, that is the New Testament way of being baptized. If you can show me any differently, I'd love to see it. I can't find one single verse that says, we are to sprinkle you. If we're going to do it, let's do it the way Jesus was baptized. Let's do it right. Let's do it biblically. So without history, without question, history tells us that the way the early church practiced baptism was by immersion. There's another question. Who are the subjects of baptism? Who are we to baptize? Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 says, For then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000, it says, was added unto them. 3,000 people, but those who received the word, those who received, believed, same word, almost synonymous in meaning, we find that they were baptized. Regardless of how a person is baptized, it begs the question, who is eligible to be baptized? Now, this may come as a surprise to you, but the New Testament, without exception, the only kind of baptism that was practiced was what was called believer's baptism. You believed, you received Christ, and then you were baptized. You know, I grew up all my life hearing preachers ask people to walk down the aisle of a church, and, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong. I mean, it giving people an opportunity to respond, but I heard them try to, sometimes they'd sing 20 stanzas of Just As I Am, uh, trying to get people to come down the aisle and, and profess their faith in Jesus Christ. But, and Charles Finney was the one who came up with that. If you know church history, you know he came up with it in about 1820, mid-20s, and it went into the 30s, of course, and it carried on, and others began to implement it. But in the New Testament, that is not the way you profess faith in Jesus Christ. You think about this. Nobody was ever asked in the entire Bible to walk down an aisle, uh, especially in the New Testament. How do we know? Because they didn't have any aisles. They didn't have aisles. So in the New Testament, the way you would profess Jesus Christ is you would be baptized. It said to the people, I mean business for God. It said to the people, I am really saved. I know Christ. And it's an outward expression to the people. It's a profession of faith but in public that you are saved. So baptism was the public profession of faith because in the Bible, two things always go together. And what are those two things? The first one is belief, and the second one is baptism. They always go together in that order, not baptism and belief, belief first and then baptism. Without exception, every time you read about someone being baptized in the New Testament, it was after they had believed on Christ and after they had repented of their sin and received Christ as Lord and Savior afterwards. Now look at some examples with me. You see them on the PowerPoint. Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 12 says, But when they believed, Philip, as he preached the things concerning the baptism of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. That was after they believed, it says. You go over to Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38, and it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and here it is, the Philippian, not, not the Philippian gentleman, but the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, See, here is water. What hinders me, he asked, from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what he said. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch, the Bible says, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Before Philip baptized the eunuch, he made sure he believed on Jesus Christ first. He made sure. This is why we don't sprinkle your babies when we dedicate your babies. Uh, we dedicate babies. 
And it's more of a dedication of the parents to the Lord that you will bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But we don't sprinkle babies. First of all, sprinkling is not the biblical way because you don't have one scripture for it. And secondly, we believe that baptism comes after belief. That is always the order that it is given found in the Bible. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 33, the Philippian jailer, there had been a terrible earthquake that shook the very foundations of the prison. And he looks at Paul and Silas, who he had beaten, and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You, and it says your household. They would hear the gospel, and they would believe too. Then they spoke the word of the Lord, it says, to him and to all of his house. They heard the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the Bible says, he took them that same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes where he had beaten them. And then immediately he and all his family, the Bible says, were baptized. And there are other examples, but time does not permit. But do you see the pattern found repeatedly in the Holy Scriptures. People were presented the gospel first. They responded to the gospel, and then they were baptized. Now, I want to hasten to add that the Bible is also plain that you do not have to be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, Some will use the thief on the cross. He wasn't, of course, baptized, but he went to paradise with Jesus. Water doesn't save anyone, regardless of whether it's a spoonful or it's a tankful. Water doesn't save it. You could be baptized in all the baptistries of Danville, Virginia, and it would not save you without faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only liquid in the Bible that will save you is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says, In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's what cleanses. Only the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. A person is never baptized in order to be saved. A person is baptized because they have been saved and they want to show outwardly God, that God has changed their hearts, that God has changed them inwardly. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, my friends, baptism is not a part of the gospel. It is not. How do we know? Paul says it's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Paul says, For God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He separates, he makes a clear distinction between baptism and the gospel. He does not make baptism a part of the gospel. And that is why we do not practice, again, infant baptism. You do not put a wedding ring on an infant and then wait for that infant to grow up and get married. You don't do that, do you? I've never seen anybody do that. It's not until an infant is old enough to find a husband or wife, and then after marriage comes the wedding ring, right? Then comes the wedding ring. And just as a wedding ring is to be put on the finger of a person who is married, baptism is to be performed only on a person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. Next, I have a third point I want you to get, and that is what is the significance of baptism? There are three words that I want to share with you today that I encourage you to write them down and to remember them And you will always understand then, if you will keep these in mind, why baptism is a big deal. And that first word is identification. Identification. Think for a moment with me. Why was Jesus baptized? Jesus, I've been asked that a hundred times or more. 
He was not a sinner. Uh, he, he was pure perfection. Why was he even baptized? Well, Jesus did not need to become a believer. He is the one that we believe in, the Bible says. And, and he, he wasn't professing his faith in God. No, my, my friend, he was God. He was God. He was deity in human flesh. So why was Jesus baptized? And that's an important question. But baptism is a means, the reason, of identification. The reason Jesus was baptized is directly related to why we should be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he was identifying himself with us, and he was giving us an example to follow when we are baptized we are identifying ourselves with him. We're saying, I, I love Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. I long for Jesus. We, and, and I want to follow Jesus. I mean, I'm serious about it. I'm going to be baptized. So how does this work? Baptism is God's fig, uh, a picture, his physical picture, we might say, of the gospel. Baptism pictures the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the baptistry this morning, when Austin was baptized, and for many years I, I did it, but it's hard for me to get there, change clothes, get back and preach, and so I got our other, some of our other pastors to start helping me, and, and thank God for that, because I'm not a, the, the young guy I used to be, but I still could handle most of you probably, but uh, in the baptistry, I, I never drowned anyone, I promise you that. <clears throat> but anyway, how does this work? It's a physical picture of the gospel. Baptism pictures, when, when you're going down, it pictures Jesus dying. When you're under, it pictures his death. When you bring you, we bring you back up, it pictures the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and guess what? That's exactly what Paul wrote. He wrote this in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, where he, he said this, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus was baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So as you read that, this passage, you will see three things very clearly. Number one, the death of Jesus Christ. We were baptized into his death. Number two, the burial of Christ. We were buried with him through baptism unto death. And then thirdly, the resurrection of Christ. That's just as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Jesus lives, and we as followers of him should walk in the newness of life because we serve a risen Lord. So baptism is a means of identification where we identify with what Jesus Christ did for us. Second word I want you to remember is not only identification, but publication. Uh, as I have already told you in the, in the New Testament, a profession of faith was not walking down the aisle of a church. It's not how it was done. It was being baptized. And 44 years ago, you know, when I got married, I immediately put on a wedding ring. And I, I've only taken it off a few times. Uh, to maybe to, well, I do take it off to clean it sometimes. Sometimes just clean it on my finger, you know, take a toothbrush or whatever, make sure it's clean. But, and I've taken it off when uh, maybe I had to have surgery. They want the jewelry off or an x-ray. Uh, I took it off one time when Seth, we went on a family vacation and we were throwing a football and it hit my finger wrong and it messed my finger up. And they had to put a stent on my finger and I had to take my ring off uh, on that occasion. But I, I didn't have to put it on the ring in order to be married. But I put on the ring in order to show that I am married. And uh, it, that, this ring means don't hit on me. I'm a married man, right? I'm a married man. You know, so I know some people go out, out of town. It can be a woman. It can be a man. And they'll take their ring off. 
and they are thinking about apparently being promiscuous. And that is not right. You need to wear your ring. I mean, even here in town. Because somebody may be looking for a wife and you don't have one on, and they go and they begin to flirt with you and talk with you. And if they do, it's your own fault because you're not wearing your ring. You say, well, I've gained a lot of weight. Well, they can stretch your ring. Go, go get the ring stretched. Wear your ring. Now, I can take the ring off. I can put it in my pocket, though. I would still be married. You see, the ring does not make me married. The ring shows that I am married. And just as a wedding ring shows that you are married, baptism shows that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that you mean business for God, and that you belong to Christ. I heard about this little boy. He went to children's church. And while he was in children's church one Sunday morning, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And the teacher told him after church was over that he should go to the pastor and that he should tell the pastor that he had been saved and that he wanted to be baptized. So after the service was over, he walked to where the pastor was standing and he he forgot the words that she told him. And when he got up to the pastor, he looked up into the pastor's face and he said, Pastor, I've been saved. I want to be advertised. Advertised. Well, quite frankly, that is exactly what baptism is. You're advertising to the people in a public fashion that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ and you want to be obedient to Him. It is your advertisement to the world that you have become a Christian, uh, a believer in Jesus Christ, accepting His death, burial, and resurrection as the payment for your sins. There's a third word I want you to get. Not only the word identification and the word publication, but also the third word is transformation. Now get this picture in your mind. Baptism pictures the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, as we have already read, found in Romans chapter 6. Whenever a person is baptized, they are picturing the death, burial, Uh, as they go down into the water, and as they come up out of the water, they're picturing the resurrection of Christ. What they are picturing is not only what Jesus has done for them, but what Jesus has done to them. They have become a new creation in Christ. A faith that doesn't work isn't a real faith. It's a phony faith, James says. And so, true saving faith, we need to obey the Lord in scriptural baptism. Uh, We've been raised as a brand new person, and baptism signifies that. It symbolizes that. And the only method of baptism that pictures that is immersion, being immersed in water. Suppose you come up to my wife, Geneva, and you say, you maybe don't know who either one of us are, and you say, may I see a picture of your husband? Uh, Now, imagine if she reached into her pocketbook and pulled out a picture of a baboon. I mean, you would probably think to yourself something like this. Man, surely she's not married to someone that ugly, uh, to a baboon. Uh, Then you would probably say, "Uh, no, that's not the picture. But what if she looked at you and said, no, that is not my husband. After all, a picture really doesn't matter anyway. No, the picture really does matter. It does matter because if she shows you a picture of anybody else except me, then she is not showing you a real picture of her husband. Well, baptism is meant to be an outside picture of an inward change that has been brought about by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And let me explain it this way. There are two church ordinances. Just two. And one is the Lord's Supper. And the other is baptism. And they both point to Christ. Now, if I would ask you, what does the Lord's Supper point to? You would obviously respond. It points to Jesus. Uh, If I would ask you, well, who does the bread and the fruit of the vine represent? And you would say the bread represents the broken body of Christ. And you would say the fruit of the vine represents the shed blood 
of Jesus Christ. Well, just as the Lord's Supper points to Jesus, so does baptism. And now, how does baptism, you say, point to Jesus? We've already seen that it points to his death, burial, even according to the Apostle Paul, and his resurrection. That's how. And and, and also points to the fact that when a person is saved by the grace of God, the old person dies. The sins are, are buried forever beneath his forgiveness, and they are raised as a brand new person that will live their lives for the Lord. Now, are we perfect? No. We still have the old Adamic nature. That old Adamic nature has not been eradicated, so sometimes we still will fail the Lord. But I'll tell you what, a new creation in Christ has a strong desire to honor God in all that they do. And if you don't have that desire, something is wrong. Uh, It is true that you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but I'll tell you what you do. You have to be baptized in order to be obedient and fruitful and to have the blessings of God on your life. Would you say, well, I, I don't want to observe communion or the Lord's Supper? No, that's important. Well, so is baptism. They're on equal par. Baptism is a command. It is not a suggestion. It is a command found in the Word of God. There may be some of you here today, you may have been baptized, but you haven't really been saved. Again, you can be baptized in all the baptismal pools of this city and still not be saved. Have you repented? What is necessary to go to heaven and be saved? You must be convicted of your sin by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God causes you to want Jesus. You you then repent of your sins You place your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, believing on the third day that he rose from the dead for you. He paid it all. He paid for your sin. Finally, there are some of you here maybe this morning, perhaps you have been saved, but you have never been biblically baptized. That is immersed since you have been saved. Uh, You may have been christened as a baby, But later on in life, you received Christ, but you have never been baptized since you have been saved. Believer's baptism. And so today you need to respond, not by becoming a believer, but already, you already are a believer. You need to respond by being obedient to the command of Jesus to be baptized. Our greatest needs are to be accepted and loved and approved. It's our greatest need. And we find all three of those in what the Father said to the Son right after he was baptized. Look at verse 11 with me. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I believe that when you obey the Lord in baptism, God the Father looks at you just like he looked at his Son, and he says the same thing to you that he said about Jesus. This is my child. I accept you. I dearly love you because you have been obedient to me. I am well pleased. That's our study of the subject of baptism this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone among us that has never been truly saved by the grace of God, they've never been born of God's Spirit. Lord, we know even Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's the physical birth. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. That's the spiritual birth. You also said the wind in that same passage bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but can not tell from where it goes or where it's coming from. And Lord, we don't know when you will sovereignly move upon any heart, but that, those verses indicate that, Lord, you move upon the heart before anyone will run to you like the publican of all for grace and mercy, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, if there's any here without Jesus, I pray that by the Holy Spirit you would convict them so that they would repent of their sin, which means turn from sin, self, and Satan to follow Christ, and that they would believe with all their heart and soul that Jesus died upon Calvary's cross for their sin, and that on the third day he rose again 
so that they could be justified. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Thank you for the finished work of Christ. And thank you, Lord, for making the order of things the way you want it in regards to communion and baptism, for making it so clear in the Word of God. We give you praise and glory, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.